episode 487. This is the Almost Daily Zencast. Hello and namaste. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. I am your humble host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. Let's get started. Greetings and salutations and a shout out to the audiences listening to this podcast around the world. Hola, Portugal. Como esta, Philippines? Konnichiwa, Japan. Cheerio, UK. Hujambo, Gabon. Saludos, España. Buenas, Colombia. Bon dia, Brazil. Kio vole, Mexico. Guten Tag, Germany. Yo, what's up, America? And Namaste, India. That's uh, in ascending order of audience participation in the top countries listening to this podcast. Welcome, one and all. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and good night to you from wherever you may be tuning in to listen to this show. And thank you for being here. Uh, so, it's been a crazy uh, several days since the last live episode. Um, and I hope you've been jumping around and checking out the episodes in our five year, almost, I think, I think we're going on seven years now. I forget how long we've been on the air. But uh, there's plenty of episodes for you to check out on an almost daily basis whenever I'm not live on any given new day. So I hope you're diving around uh, and uh, connecting the dots on all the thoughts, ideas, themes, and subject matters that we put pins on the imaginary corkboard. That's a little imaginary mechanism we use on this show. If it doesn't make sense to you now, it will eventually. Just keep listening. Um, and uh, yeah, keep connecting those dots. So today's episode, um, I wanted to take a quick moment to collectively, if I may invite you to join me, whether you believe in the power of prayer or not, to have a quick, um, solemn, meaningful moment of silence for every human being and all other life forms out there on the planet suffering during this multitudes of uh, climatological disaster events that are going on. From Florida and Cuba uh, in their flooding, there's flooding in Pakistan, in South Africa, in Nigeria, uh, in Turks and Caicos, Honduras, the Philippines, Canada, Russia, Tunisia. Well, that's a wildfire. Uh, but there's floodings and wildfires and other disastrous events in too many places around the world to count. And there are people uh, and other living creatures suffering through it all. And the rest of us are blessed beyond belief to be enduring whatever other hardships we are enduring, uh, free from the added stresses and burdens of surviving through one of these climatological disastrous events. So please join me in a moment of silent prayer, contemplation, meditation, energy sending, however you approach these sorts of moments. Uh, I hope you'll join us in it right now. Um, in honor of those who have passed and those who are suffering in these events uh, recently and in the moment and in the near future. Namaste and thank you. It's hard and stressful and distressing to live through any kind of natural disaster. It is also difficult, challenging, disheartening, depressing to witness others struggling through 
such events. I think one of the most challenging aspects is this feeling of being unable to help, right? Uh, or being unable to do anything to prevent or to uh, minimize the impacts of these kinds of disasters. Um, but there is hope. There is always hope. Um, it's difficult to talk about this because part of me wants to not say a word, right? Like, who am I to go on the air and talk about anything in the midst of such chaos? Um, from the multiple conflicts around the world, which we've taken time to honor and pray for those suffering and who have passed uh, you know, and suffered uh, through such conflicts um, recently resolved or ongoing uh, to, to climate disasters, uh, to individual personal circumstances of, you know, challenging forms or nature. Um, it becomes difficult. It's challenging for me. I had a really hard time today uh and in the last couple of days in fact i took a few days off from doing any uh creative output because it so many things were happening at once um and yet the world goes on you know those of us who are by the grace of whatever divine thing is out there uh lucky enough to to not be uh suffering uh the disastrous events that we see around the world. And, um, what can you say except, you know, my hearts, my heart and prayers go out to those who are suffering. Um, I don't have the means or the capacity to go to places, uh, and help. I don't have the means and capacity to, to give large amounts of money, um, uh, to those organizations that are out there helping. At least not yet, not until my little homegrown media empire becomes large enough. Um, <laughs> but we can still, I believe, bring the power of our focus and attention, our energy, uh, and for lack of a better term, spiritual magic uh, to, to, to the efforts of, of facilitating and consoling those who are suffering. Many would laugh at that straight up would just be like, ha ha, this guy believes in spiritual magic. Um, but isn't it fascinating how even, even the most ardent uh, non-believers will, in times of their own personal crisis, still reach out and, for lack of a better term, pray to some higher power. Um, not all of them, obviously, but many do. Um, I've, I've known... Uh, in real life, plenty of examples of people who, who, you know, don't believe, but when they're down and out, when they're, when they're seeing the rock bottom, they still reach out. Um, of course, plenty of others just hunker down and get through it on their own. And, uh, you know, I'm not judging between the two. I choose to believe because of phenomenological experiences I've had, like things that no one can talk me out of, right? They are lived experiences um, that are too visceral and too real for me to abandon. Um, these things have led me to a conclusion that although we may not understand it and it's easy to dismiss it, there is something, something powerful uh, that happens when we individually and especially collectively focus our mental, spiritual, and energetic attention uh, towards manifesting healing, manifesting um, things that are manifestable. Right? Uh, I'm not crazy. I don't. I don't believe I can sit here and imagine a million dollars hard enough to appear on my desk. You know. I, I don't buy into, not to get political in this episode, but I don't buy into Trump's bizarre claim that he could uh, uh, declassify documents just by thinking about it, right? I'm not that irrational. Um, and not to say that all spiritual beliefs are irrational. 
some of them are. But there's, there's phenomena in the world that we have yet to fully comprehend or even experience completely. Uh, and I am of the opinion um, that prayer, meditation, contemplation, and manifestation are phenomena in that category, right? That, that we don't understand them. And that's why I encourage people to explore them. I don't want to tell people how to pray. I don't even know how to pray. But I want to encourage people um, to consider. I mean, especially when we have the opportunity, when we're blessed with the situational, emotional, intellectual, and even financial security to be aware of other people's suffering. Right? Um, and although I just said I don't want to dictate to people how to pray, I do uh, have some opinions about, like, you know, whether or not prayer is a transactional phenomenon or not. Uh, I've rambled about that in previous episodes before. If you're curious about my more complex uh, statements or thinking about prayer, please dig deep into the playlist on my podcast. There's at least one or two episodes um, with the word prayer in the title. Uh, I'm thinking of one entitled the something about the power of prayer. At any rate, if you don't believe in prayer, that's fine. Um, don't pray. But I do hope that you'll contemplate um, you know, the realities of what's going on in the world and and find your own ways to send your support to others. Obviously, uh, when what people need are food, shelter, clothing, and financial relief, prayers alone, prayers without action, prayers without advocacy, prayers without organization, prayers without collaborative action prayers and this has you know been said in almost every religion prayers without taking action are empty gestures uh, and that's not what I'm calling for right I believe that if we sit in meditative contemplative prayerful state and we we don't ask for things that we want but rather, concentrate, meditate, contemplate on um, what is going on in the world and ask for guidance on how to help. Ask for guidance on, um, you know, what to do. Inspiration will come. And that inspiration that, that arrives from asking for such guidance through prayer, that points to the action that we can take. Right? If there is a dividing line between correct prayer and incorrect prayer, for lack of better terms, I would argue that incorrect prayer is transactional prayer. And correct prayer is healing prayer, emotive prayer, prayer where we broadcast our love and receive love um, now, what's the difference between transactional prayer and sending out, uh, you know, one energy and hoping to get back another? Uh, I, that's a fuzzy and very fine line. Um, but as I was saying before, I think that if there's a point to prayer, it isn't to secure um, a position in some afterlife where we will receive rewards. It isn't to to garner favor from some deity or another. It isn't to it isn't to, you know, prove one's allegiance to a chosen deity, but rather to connect with the spiritual network that we are all inherently, organically a part of. And by connecting to that spiritual network, we then engage in the collective phenomena of doing spiritual work. And that spiritual work 
might very well guide us, inspire us towards the physical work available to us that we may not be aware of, that we may not be perceiving just yet. Uh, because prayer without work, it's, it's self-congratulatory, spiritual, oh, this is going to be a, 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 a really taboo word to say or a taboo word to describe things with, but prayer without action is like, you know, spiritual masturbation. What, what are we doing? Um, when I pray, I ask for guidance about what to discuss on my, in my content, right? Uh, and what to do in my personal life, uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the private, the, the, my personal life circumstances and, and how I can take the best next step, um, as I think, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous puts it. Um, but I digress. This episode isn't supposed to be heavy-handed about prayer. Uh, let's take a moment to uh, clean this, purge the slate and reset our minds and enjoy a little bit of DJ Z musical entertainment while contemplating the collection of ideas we've already tackled and then get into the meat of the matter for today. Uh, so let's drop this track, Endless Fractal Variations, a DJ Z audio loop entertainment uh, digital fabrication in the Cosmic Pulse Groove Pad iPad Sound audio set collection. Enjoy, my friends, and I'll see you on the other side.
animatronic beings evolved before flesh pod beings did. Uh, it's all part of the Zepoverse, a multi-dimensional content creation project um, DJ Z and I are involved in. DJ Z, of course, is an imaginary fictional literary character from the uh, yet-to-be-published Many Adventures of DJ Z and Mr. Zeppo. You can explore the many dimensions of the Zeppoverse by visiting solo.to forward slash Mr. Zeppo. All right, enough self-promotion, friends. Um, holy moly, has a lot been going on. It's enough to be overwhelming, to be depressing, to be exhausting, to be outraging, uh, you know. But that's life. I had a hard time picking a title for this episode because I thought, I mean, the first thing that came to me was bracing for the storm. And then uh, in, then, then I was kind of contemplating the idea of using, um, what's that, the, the, the calm before the storm. And then, of course, I settled on in the eye of the storm. Um, why? I think that, well, there's something powerful and awe-inspiring and frightening um, and kind of mind-boggling about huge hurricane storms like this. Um, and when viewed, and, I, and by, I need, I want this to be clear, by, by no means do I mean to dismiss any of the suffering or pain I just honored at the top of the show, right? Um, on the ground, in the situation of people surviving these events, obviously, there's nothing but tragedy there. Um, well, not nothing, but, but there's, you know, it's a tragic thing that people are suffering through these disastrous events. Um, and it's fascinating how these kinds of events tend to bring out the best in humanity and, tragically, on occasion, the worst in humanity. It's always a little disheartening and depressing to see when it is the worst of humanity being expressed, when people take advantage of other people who are suffering through natural disasters. Um, you know, whether it's big, giant corporations price gouging those who are in desperate need or individuals scamming or thieving from those you know suffering and in need thankfully it seems that uh, the worst of us being inspired or brought about brought out in us by uh, by natural disasters tends to be the minority um and fascinatingly, there seem, humanity tends, uh, communities of people, and we've seen this over and over again, and it's sort of the silver lining uh, of when we witness one of these tragedies, people come together. Neighbors helping neighbors, strangers rescuing strangers, um, and, and, and you know, survivors helping each other rebuild, and communities who were lucky enough to not be involved, you know, uniting to support those communities that endured um, and suffered and survived whatever, whichever cataclysmic event. Um, but it, when we zoom out, right? When we zoom out of it and, and look at the, at literally, physically, the bigger picture, there's something fascinating. And although dangerous and destructive and frightening and, and horrific on the ground, um, when seen, for example, from space satellite imagery, there's some kind of raw, natural, awe-inspiring beauty, um, despite the pain and suffering underneath. Um, and I think there's some kind of analogy there. Did I work it all out and write it all down before I started the show? No, I rarely do. Um, that's why I, I proclaim that this show is real, raw, and radically unscripted. No one, not even me, is handing me a script before I go live, right? I'm not here to read from 
prefabricated language. I'm here to share with you my thoughts as disorganized and incoherent as they may occasionally come out. Um, I think that... I think that eventually... Um, we, as a species will be able to tap into that humanity, that inspired sense of charity, for lack of a better term, that inspired sense of communion that we experience when it's clear and obvious that you're suffering. Like, if you're in the middle of a community that has endured some horrible disaster, your suffering is is not singular. It's not, a, you are not suffering alone anymore. Whatever was going on in your life before that hurricane hit or before that tornado hit your town, before that flooding happened in your region, that's all over with. And now your entire community is suffering together. And it's in those moments that I see people as individuals transcend their individual context enough to unite indiscriminately in the recovery process. Now, tragically, this only seems to last for a brief period of time, and then the bubble bursts and the, and, and the status quo creeps back in, and, 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 you know, human flaws and foibles uh, rear their ugly head. Um, if you don't agree with that, Take a moment and look at the history of Puerto Rico. They're currently still suffering the effects and damages from the last major um, hurricane storm that hit their shores. And Puerto Rico, although not a state, is a piece of America, and they are all American citizens. Okay? So... Um... As what's what's that singer's name? I don't know his work. I've never really heard of him until the news of this most recent video dropped. I dropped. Oh, I should have had my Facebook page open. Ready to go. Um, Bad Bunny. I I can't endorse his music because I've never heard it. So I'm not going to pretend to be a fan or anything. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to be a critic either. I just don't know his work. But um, I did watch his most recent video and Americans need to watch it um, because U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico have been suffering with the consequences not only of the last storm that, that battered their island but the incompetence and corruption of the recovery efforts since then. Because they, and, men, and, and this is not exclusive to Puerto Rico, they, it's just a really strong showcase of this. The same is true in plenty of American cities um, that have suffered disasters in recent years. Uh, now, that isn't to say that, that all recovery efforts are complete wastes of time or whatever, but there's just... Remember, friends, if you're new and you don't know this about me, let me, let me, let me pause the discussion and, and make a, a, a declarative, preemptive statement. I do my best to never think of any human individual or human organization in monolithic terms. No individual and no human organization or endeavor, in my humble opinion, is a monolith of either good or bad. Have you met humanity? Have you met the human species? The, the simple reality is that every individual is a yin-yang mixture of light and dark, right? The human species is an expression of every possible variable combination of, of the component ingredients of the human species. And at our core, we are yin and yang. We are the light and the dark. And it's not a war, um, although I understand the use of such language in describing it allegorically. For example, in that, in that ancient, I think, uh, Native American Aboriginal uh, um, allegory about there being two wolves, 
inside of us fighting a white wolf and a black wolf and uh and and the wolf that that wins the fight is the one that we feed the most i understand that kind of language but i've also understood that it isn't actually a war it's more of a struggle to reintegrate we're not here to destroy the evil in the world that would be self-destructive because we are our own source of evil, just as we are our own source of divine action, of, of good, righteous, beautiful, healthy, um, transcendent behavior. And it's in these moments of crisis where we really get challenged, both as individuals and as discrete communities and as a species-wide collective. We get challenged. Are we going to feed the black wolf? Are we going to feed the white wolf? Are we going to listen to the little devil on our shoulder? Or are we going to listen to our better angels? And I know those things get thrown around. They're, they're uh, diatribes. They, they become... Ar uh, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Not archetypes. Uh, I mean, they always were archetypes, but um, it's become easily dismissed uh, platitudes, these ideas. But at the core of them, there is uh, a simple and yet mysterious truth. That there is no evil outside of us, in my humble opinion, right? Um, in some other era humanity would collectively point their fingers at nature itself and call that evil because something was dangerous. Storms, evil. Volcanoes, evil. Creatures that desire to eat us for food, evil. Right? Now, is that true? I've struggled with this question my entire thinking life. And that started at a ridiculously young age, um, by most people's standards. Uh, but the more I questioned, the more I sought answers, the more I questioned, um, quote unquote, common sense, pin on the corkboard, I don't think common sense has ever existed. I've talked about it before. I'm sure I'll talk about it again. So just put a pin on the cork board with the term common sense. I don't think it's ever existed. And I think it is used as a form of coercion. Right? You don't want to belong to the group that lacks common sense. You want to belong to the group that clearly is on the right side of common sense. But if common sense doesn't exist, then it's a tool used to divide. So those people over there have no common sense. That person over there has no common sense, but I do. Anyways, I digress. That was a tangent. Pin on the cork board. Um, we've pointed to external sources of evil, right? We blame this, this cartoon monster we call by many names. Um, but as... One ancient, I believe, uh, culturally Indian, uh, from India, not from American Indians, but from India, Hindu uh, wisdom teaching. And I don't know the exact origin or source of it, but I've, I've, I've seen this, this stated many ways in many different places and attributed to different authors or writers or speakers or whatever. But at the core, I think the words make a lot of sense. That God and Satan, right? Good and evil are not external powers or individuals or beings or personhoods, but rather internal phenomena. That's, that the devil is our most lowest impulses, our most primal uh, animalistic impulses. And that Divinity, or God, is our highest order of consciousness. Now this, to me, after much questioning, much thinking about it, much 
analyzing it and, more importantly, much uh, meditative contemplation of it, right? We can only get so far with language and with logic and with rational analysis. While very useful tools, they have their limitations. As a different spiritual wisdom teaching indicates, we will only truly get the answers once we set aside those tools and silence our mind so that we may receive the divine guidance, the spiritual inspiration. Um, what does that have to do with, with, with the storm and, and with the physical things going on in the world? Um, as we were saying, these events tend to bring out the best or the worst in us. Right? Um, but we can also, we don't have to wait. We can also just tap into those things internally. Instead of seeking salvation from some cartoon character deity, and I mean no disrespect um, to those who are deeply attached to the personified uh, descriptions of divinity, right? I'm not judging that. I'm just suggesting that perhaps we must look beyond the descriptions because language itself is never sufficient. As I, I do think God itself has pointed out a few times, um, we can access that divine inspiration or fall victim to our own uh, primal urges because they, they are inherent, uh, inherently residing within us. Of course, these disasters are now perpetually happening all the time. It's becoming increasingly difficult to ignore them, right? The rate of increase has been exponentially growing over the past 30 years. So for 30 years, we've been arguing and debating and fighting and yelling at each other collectively about climate change. Now, I find the debate kind of meaningless and besides the point. I mean, the climate is changing, period. The, the, the existing historical records of meteorological patterns is clear. There's no debating that. Climate is increasingly becoming more volatile. Extremes in climate are becoming more extreme. This cannot be denied, right? Uh, although denialism is strong in the world today. For example, <laughs> and I mean, I do not mean to take light of people suffering in Florida, but there's been a massive hurricane event that has caused billions of dollars in damage has left millions of homes without power and has demolished countless uh, structures and, you know. And I wonder, here's my question. This is all the case and the suffering is tragic and my heart goes out to everyone who is in pain and who's lost everything they own or lost loved ones. But I wonder, and, and forgive me if this sounds cynical, I wonder how many Floridians who are also self-declared conspiracy theorists who have, over the last, say, 20 years, been foaming at the mouth with their outrage at organizations like, say, FEMA, for example. I mean, for as far back as I can remember, since Reagan was in office... We have been hearing from the conspiracy theory community, which I understand is no monolith of, of, uh, of agreement here. There's, 
there's a broad spectrum of often completely uh, incongruous and, and mutually excluding conspiracy theories that just don't jive together. But I digress. One of the recurring claims that has been rebundled and repackaged and and re uh, fear mongered throughout the last 30 years is that FEMA is coming to destroy us all. But I wonder how many Floridians in this aftermath are going to reject FEMA help because of their paranoid belief that FEMA is secretly out to, to kill them. And how many of these self-proclaimed conspiracy theorists are just going to conveniently ignore that they had some point in the last 30 years made such claims and take the help anyway. And I hope they do. Not only, I literally pray that conspiracy theorists living through these disasters in the United States of America are confronted with the reality that FEMA and the federal government, and whether it's riddled with corruption or not, is a separate issue, but they they ostensibly are there to provide assistance and relief. Is there probably going to be, you know, corruption exposed? No doubt. I mean, we're still exposing corruption and incompetence and failures in the emergency response uh, to big events like Katrina, for example, right? That's just the one big storm that came up top of my head that was it was huge and everyone was aware and, you know, massive amounts of, of aid at the state level, at the, at the charity, charitable giving level and at the federal level um, was promised and offered and, uh, and then corruption was exposed, discovered, per se. Um, and this, this is part of a larger issue, right? Like pins on the cork board already. Uh, but let me be very clear about this. There is a difference between criticizing conspiracy theory content and denying that there is corruption and, you know, greed and real groups of people in privileged and powerful positions that conspire to benefit themselves instead of facilitating the helping of others. I mean, I'm not denying any of that. Um, but in, for example, using FEMA as a case study, if we acknowledge that there have been instances of corruption, right? One of the r most real, accurate, undeniable criticisms of FEMA's work is that, curiously enough, over, you know, uh, the last 30 years of recent history of, of natural disasters, they have somehow managed to more efficiently give aid and support to white communities as opposed to minority communities. And, and that's, that's just one of those examples of like, yeah, duh, there's corruption. There's, there's, there's forms of, of obvious and or sublimated bias. Um, but are the conspiracy, but does that mean, I don't think so, right? Like, does that mean that the conspiracy theory claims about FEMA are absolutely true? No, I don't think so. I'll put it to you this way. While I would still continue to speak out and address the problematic issues, I would take the help if I was in Florida right now. Anyways, um... Pins on the corkboard, conspiracy theory versus real life corruption and problematic political issues, etc. We've discussed that uh, many a times before in the show, and we will return to those such subjects again, I'm sure, no doubt. Um, but why did I bring that up? Because there is real greed. In the world, there is real corruption in the world. There are real, um, you know, discrete and and specific instances of cons 
uh, of conspiracies to get away with abusing systems or other people, etc. I mean, there's examples of it all the time. And one of the most hilarious ironies of the conspiracy theory community is that they point fingers in all kinds of absurd directions, and yet they do not see the obvious abuses of power going on in their own chosen political idols. Now, I'm not a person who believes that 100% of politics and 100% of politicians are evil and corrupt. I cannot agree to such claims. Because that would mean that I choose to believe that certain individuals are monoliths of pure evil and therefore unworthy of salvation, of, um, of forgiveness, and of the opportunity uh, to... What's the word I'm looking for? Ah! Shit, I hate it when words drop right out of my mouth, right before I say them. Um, or right out of my brain. What it, the word that we use when someone overcomes their past in order to become a better person. There's a, there's a word for that. You know what I'm saying. Um, as soon as we start thinking like that about each other, no progress can be made. As soon as we divide ourselves into self-righteous groups that deny our own tribe's problematic issues and only choose to perceive and then exaggerate and hypervilify the problematic issues of everybody else's tribe. We can no longer unite as a human species. We can no longer facilitate each other as members of the human species. We can no longer heal ourselves and one another as members of this species-wide family that we truly are. All human beings are genetically 9.9999 ad nauseum number of nines, genetically identical, right? That's, that's a tiny fragment of a fragment of a fragment of a percentage of nuanced difference in our genetic code. Pins on the cork board. We've done whole episodes about that before, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again. Um, where am I going with all this? These natural disasters are happening amidst a collection of geopolitical economic disasters of equally historic proportions. Um, you know, events like January 6th here in the United States. The uncounted number of... of uh, political and military conflicts going on around the world. I mean, if I had a list in front of me, I'd, I'd, I'd acknowledge some of them. I've done it before. I'm sure I'll do it again. You've got the internet in front of you. Um, the human species, as a collective unity, will continue to bash its head against a brick wall, in my humble opinion, as long as it continues to insist to cling to us versus them ideological construct models. Which brings me to one of the most core concepts of the podcast, um, which I talked about before. I've talked about it again. I will talk about it again. I just want to, I just want to mention it. Pin on the court board. And this will seem a little bit far out there, uh, far afield, but um, it's all interconnected, I assure you. A lot of people out there are arguing um, about and or advocating for escaping, destroying, dismantling, burning down, you know, lots of terms like that. Um, in, in, they're advocating for the destruction of the quote-unquote matrix. And this is a, an issue of deep concern for me, which people on, in all categories of, of self-identifying pseudo-philosophical thought uh, find a little, like, confusing for, to, for me to state. We are, as, as, you know, in terms of spiritual communities and, and in terms of, you know, political communities and, you know, in, in the public discourse spheres 
where this kind of language is used, I believe that we are leading ourselves astray and missing the point. People talk about escaping or burning down or destroying the matrix, right? Now, let me, let me restate something I said before in the show, and, and I'm sure I'll say again, but I think is really, really worth contemplating and discussing collectively with, with each other around the world. The matrix, as a terminology, uh, meant something in ancient times, in spiritual teachings, in wisdom teachings, in religious teachings, than it does, than, than how we are popularly using it now. And while it's perfectly normal for words to evolve and for meanings to change over time, all languages, even the strictest of ones, are ultimately common use languages because it is the using of it by the living body of people who use that language that ultimately shapes the definition of terms. Now, there's plenty of people arguing that there's an an explicit or overt dumbing down of America or of the world. And it's funny how some, even some of the people who have, you know, raised this concern in the past, they'll still want to argue against me when what I'm trying to say here. The matrix cannot be escaped because the matrix is not in its true definition, in its true meaning, in its true intended form. The word, the term, the matrix does not refer to an artificial construct, to a simulation, to ideological mental paradigms, which is what people use it as today, right? When If you go on the internet or you, you encounter people talking about in, these, in this way um, about escaping the matrix, about destroying the matrix, about fighting against the matrix, about tearing it down, about burning it to the ground, they think they're saying one thing, But the true, authentic meaning of that term is more valid than the misconstrued and misleading way it's been redefined. The term existed for eons before the movie ever used it, right? And the movie's beautiful. I love the movie. It's it's a powerful visual analogy for political, religious, philosophical ideology, mental constructs the invisible mental cages that we create for ourselves. The problematic issue that I find is that the matrix is something else than that. And if we ignore that, if we reject that meaning, then we are fighting the wrong fight. Even if we think we know that we mean the right meaning. Here's why. What does the matrix actually mean? If you do the research and look into the deepest, most ancient explanations of the term, it means the divine, ineffable, indescribable, mysterious mother womb that is gestating all life. The matrix is Mother Earth. The matrix is that which we refer to with such terms as Gaia or the goddess or divinity, the matrix is the universe itself, the divine phenomena that brings about life. We cannot escape it any more than a seed can escape the inside of the fruit it is in. We cannot destroy the matrix any more then a seed inside an apple can destroy the apple. And we should not, in my humble opinion, be discussing things in that misconstrued way. We need language matters, right? And I'm not I'm not arguing for a strict tyrannical adherence to prescribed definitions. That's a whole nother issue, right? Language must evolve. But we must recognize what we're doing when we take one term that means, especially a divine term, a term that points to a spiritual mystery of divinity, and then use it incorrectly. Because then, you know, it creates misunderstandings, miscommunications, and then we start fighting against 
the wrong things. Um, but I digress. I digress. I digress. The eye of the storm is an analogy. It uh, for me, it's it's sort of. I was talking about the the awe and the 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 raw natural beauty of things that are chaotic and disastrous to you know in their impacts. There's an analogy there, I think. Um, not just an analogy because my mind decides to create a mental construct, but an analogy because nature is fractal in its form, function, and nature. Another subject we've talked about before on the show, please do dig up the episodes that have the word fractal in the title. And it's also things that it's also a phrase or a theme that comes up and I explore as a sidebar in various episodes. Um, if you don't know what a fractal is, really quickly, it's a it's a mathematic it's a mathematical algorithm um, that was developed, or some would describe it as discovered, uh, by a mathematician by the name of Mandelbrot. And it this this algorithm accurately describes patterns in nature. In fact, the the mathematics is entirely inspired by patterns in nature. Um. Now I get it. There's plenty of arguments about how math can be misused to manipulate. That math uh, as a tool of science is corruptible. Absolutely, for sure. But again, like no thing is a monolith of evil and no thing is a monolith of good. Um, we can't just chuck math out the window. Right? None of the devices that we're using to entertain ourselves with would function if math were an absolute lie, if it were a monolith of a monolith of untruth. Math clearly has got something going on. Mathematics, in all its you know increasingly complex forms, must be describing something about the universe accurately, or else it wouldn't fucking work the way it does. Does that mean I'm going to blindly believe any mathematician that makes any crazy claim? Of course not. I don't, I don't buy into anything blindly. I get a lot of shit from people on the far right because I dare to comment on mainstream media headlines. I think that they assume that because I, in social media, will share a mainstream media headline and then comment about it and share my thoughts about it, that I must blindly believe whatever narrative is being shared. That's, that's absolutely not a fair thing to accuse me of because it's typically not true. But I digress. Um, fractal mathematics is, it appears, according to some theories, and if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll disengage with such theories, but I'm a fan of these theories. Fractal mathematics. Let's, let's make up a term. Quantum mechanical fractal mathematics. Um, and yes, I know I just made that. I just merged two terms that are not typically used together. I think there's room to merge them, though, and I, I don't pretend to be an expert in anything, um, but I am a, a hobbyist enthusiast of, of of just trying to pay attention to, to science, especially where the science seems to be solid. Um, the universe is not evil, right, in my opinion. And it's sad and tragic to me when people adopt, either knowingly or unconsciously, unwittingly, a worldview that pits them, the righteous, against the universe of evil. We will never heal ourselves. We will never reintegrate our relationship to the natural surroundings that gave rise to us if we continue to divide ourselves that way against each other and the very environmental context that created us. We cannot vilify the womb that is gestating our being. Just like, as I've argued before in many episodes, we cannot commodify her body. That's all, that's all we've done in postmodern, post-industrial uh, history, is rip the bones and flesh and blood of the very living womb that is Mother Earth, that is Gaia, 
that is that gave rise to us here in this mind-bogglingly bizarre, beautiful, and sometimes frightening place. Because of silly, flat, two-dimensional conceptions of that being, we've cartoonified it. We've otherified it. We've objectified a living entity that gestates us. Um, and I'm not trying to make an argument that therefore she's punishing us. No. But this, this womb is a very complex system of interrelated systems. Nothing is separate. Um, there's, a, there's a beautiful meme going around, has been going around for years, uh, that says something along the lines of, I don't have it in front of me, so forgive me if I'm, I'm not quoting it exactly, but when the flowers in our gardens are doing poorly, we fix the soil not the flower. And I get it. It's beautiful. It makes sense. It's not wrong, but it's also not sharing the full context because the flower is not separate from its environment. The vegetable cannot grow without the nutrients and environmental support it is accustomed to growing in. Now, we can engineer alternatives for sure. But I mean, under natural circumstances, right? Let's set aside the entire idea or notion and argument about um, scientific agriculture. There's, there is a lot to discuss there because there's some amazing ideas and there's some horribly terrible ideas and, and everything in between going on in, in, that, in that realm uh, about, you know, like bioengineered agriculture or whatever you want to call it. But in terms of natural organic conditions, right? No, no vegetable is separate from its environment. The moment you tear it out of the dirt, it is dying. Without creating some scientifically engineered replacement for its natural environment, that flower, that plant, that vegetable, whatever it is, it will not survive, right? Because it is not separate from its environment. Neither are we. One of my biggest pet peeves about the climate change debate is that it's besides the point. This is something that cannot, and forgive me if I've already said it in this episode. I've been thinking about it a lot, so I don't remember if I've already said it or it's just me being triggered by my own memories of having thought about it. Um, but, the climate is changing, period. And in the historical period since the Industrial Revolution, the human species has been pumping out toxic waste. So never mind the, the nuanced debate about whether or not the climate change is being directly caused by industrial activity or not. Let's pretend it's not, just for, for the sake of argument. Let's pretend that the, while not denying the change in the climate, in the, in the, in the extremes of weather events uh, globally, let's pretend that it's become scientific consensus that it's not man-made activity. Okay, great. Is that an excuse to not change our industrial uh, choices? No. Because even if it were true, this scenario I'm describing, the industrial waste we create that has been exponentially growing for how long is it now? 150 years or something? Since the Industrial Revolution, I forget, 200 years? It hasn't quite been 300 years, but it's along that line. So in, in the couple of hundred years that we've been, it's just exponential growth. And the churning out of literal toxic waste. If you take a human being and you put them in enclosed space with a combustion engine of any kind, forget what kind, any kind of combustion engine that's burning fossil fuels without an air vent, that human being will not survive. Because that engine that combustion engine is churning out 
raw, toxic waste. We can't ignore that. Even if it isn't causing the escalation of extremity in, in climatological events and disasters, we're still poisoning ourselves. Collectively, no one will escape that. If we do not change our industrial mechanisms and systems that churn out untold massive amounts of waste every day that is poisonous to life, then it's irrelevant how extreme the, the climate becomes. Even if suddenly the climate started to get normal again, we would continue to poison ourselves? That's madness. And, and what is the motivating factor behind all of that? The accumulation and hoarding of imaginary wealth. Because economics is made up, yo. That's a pin on the cork board. We've talked about it many times before. We've done a whole episode about it. We'll probably do special episodes about it again. While it renders tangible results, both good and, you know, positive and negative, good and bad, people enjoy luxury and people suffer poverty, the system itself, the quote-unquote laws of the economic system, totally man-made. That's the matrix, right? And I get that that's what people think that they are correctly indicating, but the thing is, the term is invoking mother. Whenever you say, we've got to tear down the matrix, Mother Nature hears, you're going to tear down the womb that is gestating you? What? That's, that's, that's Mother Nature's response. I've, I've brought up this analogy before, and forgive me for being redundant, but imagine if you could suddenly travel into you know, your intestines and visit the, the multiple colonies of different species of, of, of uh, intestinal, you know, the intestinal biome of all those, of all those what are they called? All the little organisms that, that, that facilitate your digestive process and live on you. They live in you. Um, you are a planet to them. Imagine if they were sitting around uh, debating whether or not they should tear your insides up in order to destroy your flesh and bones to create products in order to render profit. You'd be horrified, wouldn't you? You desperately want to reach them and communicate with them. Hey, whoa, you can't, you can't like rip up my insides just so you can make imaginary money. I'm alive. And without me, you cannot be alive. That's the relationship that we are currently unfortunately in as a collection as a collective species we are continue perpetually ignoring the reality that the living nature around us is what gave rise to us and that if we continue to destroy it to commodify it in order to hoard and abuse the profit and the power that comes from that both of which are... Now, imaginary things can be very tangibly real in their impact. I'm not denying that when I say economics is imaginary, right? I said it. The positive and negative impacts of the result of economic activity are very tangible, very real. But the ideological construct is purely imaginary. That doesn't make it evil. It means, in my opinion, that we can redefine it without engaging in some ideologically driven argument about imaginary concepts about how righteous or evil some uh, this economic system or the other is, right? I don't think any particular given economic system is inherently evil or righteous. I think the way that economic system is implemented, used, and or abused reveals our capacity as individuals and as a collective species to perpetuate our own evils on ourselves or 
to turn towards our divine nature and our higher angels and perpetuate grace upon ourselves and each other. This can sound like a really, you know, highfalutin, frou-frou, silly, crazy thing to discuss in the face of the, of the abject horrors in the world, in the face of the simple realities that people are suffering through. Um, I get that. Chaos has always been a part of our lives. From, you know, throughout our evolutionary development, when we were part of the food chain and, and we had to deal with other creatures that could consume us and eat us in order to be sustained and, and kept alive, right? Um, and we've vilified nature because of our fear of that. Our fear of climatological events we didn't understand. Our fear of living entities that saw, perceived us as food. But, I mean, is a lion evil for hunting down the food it needs to hunt down to feed its family? Is the chicken evil for eating the worm so that it can receive the nutrients it needs in order to create the eggs that then we consume? Nature is profoundly more complex, more subtle, uh, and more chaotic than any two-dimensional us versus them, I am righteous, the, the rest of you motherfuckers are evil mentality. And those, 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 kinds, th those mental constructs, having that kind of mentality, clinging to that sort of ideological construct, is, is blindering you. It's blindering us as a species. We won't solve the ever-increasing problem of climate change, of climatological extreme weather events by perpetuating the system as it is, by building more toxic industrial mechanisms, right? We need to back up Reevaluate the choices we've collectively made. Stop shrugging the responsibility for what we've inherited. Yeah, our ancestors are not us, but they also are. <laughs> Duality is a tricky thing, right? For example, to go on a sidebar. Uh, in the discussion of race and racism, the descendants here in America of of those who fought to preserve racist ideology as part of the national identity, they will often deflect the modern concerns and questions and con complaints um, brought up by those who are suffering at the hands of both systemic and individual racism and say, well, I'm not responsible for what my forefathers did. Um, you're not to blame. No one is to blame for what their forefathers did. But arguably, we as a collective species are responsible for responding to the, the, the complex legacy that we've inherited, Right? And that's a challenge. I'm not saying that that's easy. But I am suggesting that there is a concerted effort. And here's, here's where I acknowledge conspiracy, right? <laughs> conspiracy, Self-proclaimed conspiracy theorists, especially those that are hung up on the us versus them 
indoctrination of a lot of conspiracy theory content, are more preoccupied with punishing those who refuse to blindly agree with their preferred conspiracy theory model. Gee, who does that benefit the most? Maybe the actual conspiracies that profit from the conflict they create? Maybe the actual, you know, bad actors in the world? And I don't mean that in, that it's, you know, all production, but rather, let's just use a different term. Those that are corrupt, those that are in positions of power and choose to abuse that power, they benefit they profit from this phenomena known as the conspiracy theory movement because, the con and I hate to kind of linger on this notion, but the conspiracy theory community, because it is a community, although curiously plenty of self-proclaimed conspiracy theorists have told me that I'm wrong about that. Whether it recognizes itself as a community or not, there is a community of people who refuse to acknowledge that their collective claims are in wild and various levels of disagreement with each other. And there's no consensus, right? And that they perpetually just turn a blind eye when their claims are debunked. Conspiracy theorists, and I don't have examples, but... It seems unfathomable to me that there are zero conspiracy theorists in Florida that will, in the coming days and weeks, you know, like, they, it, it, what am I trying to say? It seems impossible. It, it seems impossible for me to just pretend that there are zero conspiracy theorists in Florida that, in the coming days and weeks, will willingly receive help from FEMA, despite whatever ardent fervent claims and shouting from their virtual rooftops they may have done in the past about how evil FEMA is. Because the bottom line is, when you need help, you take the help. Right? Especially if you are in such dire straits that it's, it's, it's life or death. Am I blindly defending FEMA? Of course not. I mean, I've, I think I've already covered that. Um, but my point is, it benefits those who are actually conspiring in the world to remain in power, to abuse the power that they have, to profit from that abuse of power. It benefits them the most when conspiracy theory content is absurdly improbable and yet seductively alluring to people. That's why, despite that I'm well aware that there are massive problems out in the world, there's massive corruption, there's corporate greed, there's political greed, there's military issues, you know, there's, duh, I'm not denying that. I'm just pointing out, what good does it do to believe in and then fight with anyone who refuse, refuses to blindly also believe in a particular conspiracy theory content, if in all that argumentation, in all of that fighting, in all that declaration, you're not actually solving anything. I've been hearing that FEMA is going to kill us all for 30 years. A, they haven't done it, so they must be incredibly inefficient or incompetent. B, during all of that time, Americans have depended on FEMA after natural disasters to get by. Have they, has FEMA shown that they've got problematic issues and need to be reformed? Absolutely. Did they try to kill everyone? Absolutely not. Did the people who blindly bought into the claims about FEMA coming from mysterious and unverifiable conspiracy theory content sources waste a lot of time and energy yelling at other people instead of working towards solving the problems that we face in the world? That's what it looks like to me, dear friends. And that's why, um, despite the fact that I understand that there are 
powerful people that choose to do evil and conspire with others to get away with it, I refuse to buy into conspiracy theory content, especially blindly, especially in the way that most self-proclaimed conspiracy theorists do, which is to pat themselves on the back for being right, abuse anyone who doesn't agree with them and claim that they're crazy and wrong and, and unworthy of whatever righteousness is promised by the conspiracy theory content. I mean, Trump is another great example. Trump and the Q phenomena. Five years Trump was in office. He didn't arrest Hillary Clinton. I mean, sure, he did a, some things, and I've already talked about this before on the show, but the really crazy conspiracy theory content never happened. The storm, quote unquote, never came. And they're still waving that flag, yo. The storm is coming. Really? When? How? What storm? What the fuck are you talking about? And who benefited the most? Donald J. Trump. Who pocketed millions of dollars from bogus fundraising? Donald J. Trump. What problems are solved? Very few. None, actually, in my opinion. But there were a couple of things that he did in office that I technically can't disagree with. But still, did, we, did he feed the homeless? No. Did he house the houseless? No. Did he cure the sick? No. And yet, there are people to this day claiming that he is Jesus Christ come again. Hot take. If Jesus showed up right now, the real Jesus, the Yeshua, incarnate once more, not, and not in some like updated version, for, but the one from back in the day, I'm fairly certain, and I get it, I could be wrong, but I'm fairly certain that he would be leading the movement to uh, hold Trump accountable for his lies and abuse of American Christian ideology. But, you know, that's part of the sidebar, pin on the corkboard. There's a whole series of ideas that I have about like if Jesus were here today like the actual Jesus from the Bible um, that I think a lot of people would find disagreeable or downright offensive uh, but I digress the eye of the storm as an analogy to, to get to land on the point the universe is a fractal right fractals are recursive in nature the patterns repeat and repeat and repeat, creating complexity until they break down back into simplicity. That's what generates our reality. That's what brings about everything from the, our chromosomes to, you know, the patterns it, we see in nature. It's all fractal algorithmic expression of reality manifesting creating, giving birth to. Um, and that process is chaotic, right? The chaos is not inherently evil. The storm is not inherently evil. The shark that will bite you if you, you know, are swimming in its territorial waters is not inherently evil. And this is a bold statement that even the most open-minded may, 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 sort of clutch their pearls at. The most horrible of human beings that have done the most odious and vile things in history or now, in present day, are not inherently monoliths of evil. Where can we go from that once we accept that? Healing? And that's the answer, friends, right? There's a lot of people that agree despite whatever other varying ideas they might associate with that love is the answer. I mean, it's kind of charming and weird and, and, and it makes me giggle when people on the left and people on the right ignore that they have that one thing in common. I've seen Trump supporters in the same social media post talk about the evils of the left, like the hyperbolically super insane, like you can't really think that's true. And then 
end the post with love is the answer. After calling for violence against these monsters that they pursue on the left. The left, although not quite as like religiously exaggerated in their in their us versus themism, kind of does the same thing. Now, if you had to put a gun to my head and ask me, you've got to vote for one side or the other, which would I pick? I, I cannot, I cannot and have not, since Reagan was in office, side with the Republican Party and, and the spectrum of ideological um, constructs that are part of the, the right wing of American political society. I, can't, I just can't. So if I had to choose between only one of those two things, I would have to choose the left and the Democratic Party, right? But in doing so, I would never give up my calling out of the fact that it seems that at the highest levels of power, they are clearly... Um, what's the word? To some degree or another, they are complicit in each other's nonsense. Uh, but I digress. I, I, I spiraled out of control. Spirals. Everything's a spiral, right? Nature is chaotic. The, the very cosmos, the, the, the mechanisms by which this living womb brought about the Goldilocks conditions, as, as some scientists would call it, um, for life to happen here on Earth and arguably in other places in the universe... Those, those procedures, those mechanisms, those processes, those organic events, while, while they have rendered these, these Goldilocks ideal situations for us to thrive in, they are also inherently chaotic. Now, chaos is not evil, but it is occasionally terrifying, destructive, and um, deadly. But just as, just as we were saying, or as I was saying, the shark that must eat you because it has to feed isn't inherently evil. The chaos in the universe that, that leads to tragic ends is not inherently evil. We must, life must die. Death is a prerequisite for life. Pin on the corkboard. Done a whole episode about it, I believe. Um, so we've got to transcend that thinking, first of all. I think it's one of the fundamental barriers that keeps us from uniting as a species. That, that some of us are righteous and some of us are evil. We all have the capacity to be as evil as anyone else. And we all have the capacity to be as good as anyone else is. Now, just as with any vice, any habit, any addiction, once you're hooked on greed and corruption and the unfair accumulation of power, etc. All the quote-unquote bad things in the world. Well, that addiction is tough to break, and that addiction feeds on itself. That's why, you know, criminals aspire to greater and greater achievements in their criminality. I mean, just look at how ambitious and yet absurdly, you know, full of failure Trump's rise to power has been. Do I hate Trump? Absolutely not. Do I vilify him as Satan incarnate? No. <laughs> I Just like I refuse to agree that he is somehow an agent of Christ or Christ himself, I think that's, that's, that's just mind-bogglingly impossible to agree to. And I cannot comprehend how anyone has and continues to agree to that idea. When, was, when, when has Trump been Christ-like? Keep in mind... I categorically reject the postmodern American Christian image of Christ strapped and armed with weapons to the teeth and dressed up like Rambo. That's some sort of devious, corrupt manipulation of Christ. But then again, most of organized religion is riddled with corrupt manipulation of the ancient teachings that, is, that, that inspired the establishment of organized religion. Pin on the corkboard. But, like, the problem is, Trump is not Christ-like. I'm sorry. He just isn't. Was making fun of that disabled journalist Christ-like? 
was his attempt to sexually harass and or assault multiple women Christ-like? Was his uh, cheating on every wife he's ever married Christ-like? Was his um, exposed fraudulent charity from before he ran for office Christ-like? To run a, a fraudulent scam of a charitable uh, you know, fundraiser to then, you know, pay yourself out of the funds. Is that Christ-like? I really cannot comprehend at a, at, a, at a rational, intellectual place how anyone can look at Donald Trump and be like, yep, that's the most Christ-like politician I've ever seen. I think that honor goes to um, President Ford. Right? The guy right after Nixon? Maybe not from when he was in office, but since then. But but then again, um, plenty of Christians now adamantly believe in, fervently believe in, some kind of Rambo Jesus that wants us all to butcher each other. And that literally makes no sense given that Jesus told his followers to put his, their swords down, melt them into plowshares, and allow the Romans to arrest and murder him. But pin on the corkboard. Um, it's I mean, I've said plenty of things throughout the years about my understanding and thoughts about the Christ. And amazingly, for for almost since it was posted, the number one most listened to episode in my podcast is the one entitled Yeshua Christos. Thank you to all those who are listening. Um, and I beg forgiveness to all those who I may have offended. Right? But my God-given free speech and free will uh, compels me. The fact that I know we all have God-given free speech. Right? And God, I use that term loosely because I don't believe in the version of God perpetuated by almost any organized religion. Uh, just like I don't believe in the moon, right? Uh, that does not mean that I think it's fake. That does not mean I think it's made out of cheese or that it's a superstructure made by aliens. It means I don't believe in it. I experience it. Whatever it is, I can phenomenologically experience it. I may not be able to explain it, but I experience it the way I experience the sun. The way I experience the air that I breathe. The way I experience the gravity that keeps me from, you know, drifting away from, from this, this tiny little uh, living womb in space. The cosmos. Uh, but put a pin in belief and how it's used because I've done at least two episodes about that in the past. Love is indeed the answer, but, you know, the truth really will set you free. But those who would prefer to continue to distract and divide us in order to continue to profiteer on the destruction of the very nature that gives rise to us would rather have us all busy arguing and fighting with each other and pointing fingers at each other and each other's favorite politicians and each other's groups of tribes or whatever because they that gives them the room and the coverage and the and the leeway to continue to do what they've been doing and the solution isn't to hate them whoever they are i don't pretend to know exactly who they are it doesn't matter who they are what matters in my opinion is whether or not we recognize that we've been distracted, whether or not we acknowledge that we've been seduced by ideological constructs riddled with neuro-linguistic programming that although they might contain nuggets of truths and half-truths, are engineered to keep us on treadmills of distractionary argumentation instead of transcending and uniting and solving the world's problems that we ourselves created. 
Because while we simultaneously are not the same individuals as our forefathers and foremothers, we are also precisely exactly that, in my humble opinion. That's what duality, non-duality is, in my humble opinion. You, as an individual, are simultaneously, uniquely, and entirely your own individualized self. And yet, in a mysterious, very difficult to describe kind of way, you are also simultaneously everyone else who exists, everyone else who has ever existed, everyone else who will ever exist. We can get sidetracked into discussing, you know, the fascinating subject matter of where does consciousness come from? Um, but, you know, to put it simply... I don't think it comes from the however many pounds of neurological, you know, meat in our skulls. I think that the brain is a part of the process of consciousness. Um, and, and belief isn't really the right word. I have un come to understand, based on phenomenological experiences... That the brain is not the source of my thinking or my thoughts or my sensation of being aware of myself, but it is part of the process. The way, um, the way the speaker or the antenna on, on a radio is not the source of the, the program that you're listening to, but it is part of the mechanism by which you are able to enjoy that program. Right? Your computer is not the source of me hosting this show, but it is an inherent and necessary part of the phenomenological chain of events that are required in order for you to enjoy listening to my show. But that's a whole other very complicated um, discussion, consciousness and, and the ramifications of truly understanding our own phenomena of consciousness. Um, but therein lies the mystery. And, and, and I think I've come to the conclusion that, and I hope I'm not wrong, that therein lies the source of our solutions to these problems. I don't, I really, and I say this often, so I feel like a broken record, but I feel it, it it's warranted and it deserves being said often. We will not solve the problems that we are facing today by blaming the past or vilifying those involved in the present. But we might actually transcend the thinking that created the problems if we turn inwards in order to discover the mysteries of our consciousness, have the phenomenological experiences that I'm referring to as a collective species, and understand one another. Be in that modality that is beyond language, right? Even even within the lim, you know the the demographic of those who describe themselves as spiritual, language is one of those things that creates division. Is it an evil, nefarious plot to manipulate all people who describe themselves as spiritual? Maybe I don't know. Is it an inherent flaw and problematic issue of the way language is is? simultaneously useful and beautiful and 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 very adept at communicating I, complex ideas um but is also ha it also has its limits and is not capable of describing certain phenomena in the universe i mean and, and this is inherently true like the things that math can describe words can only sort of describe how math describes it right that's what, that's what makes listening to someone talk about quantum mechanical physics different than actually doing the math behind quantum mechanical physics and understanding the math. Uh, but that's a whole other sidebar of discussion. Our lives have always been riddled with chaos, punctuated by moments of tranquility and peace. It's always been the case. 
Sometimes those punctuated moments seem to last for a very long time. Sometimes those moments are so mercurial and elusive that they seem to last barely a moment. It's an ebb and flow. It, you, you can't demand for only one and, and, and reject the other. The chaos will always be part of the process. There will always be storms to, to ride out and survive through. But as an analogy, um, or I'm trying to, you know, land this is that like we can either fight about like when the eye, when we find ourselves in the eye of the storm in these punctuated moments of tranquility, whether in our own personal lives or in the collective lives of our communities, in, at the city level, at the state level, at the federal level, at the international level, at the global level, if we if we abandon our collective efforts to help each other after the emergency seems to have been survived, only to pick up where we left off in the argumentation about the evil nature of the storm, we will never find the solutions to the problems we've created which make the impacts of the storm worse. We could be transcending the ideological constructs the cages in our minds in order to understand and appreciate the mother matrix, the natural phenomena that gives rise to us, of which we are not separate. It, the, more, the, the more deeply we understand as a species that we are literally seeds inside a fruit, that we don't have the right to commodify and destroy that fruit. That there are other ways in which we can be relating to the fruit that is gestating us so that we can be born and become another tree and bear more fruit. Then we're just going to dig our own graves as a species. right? If we don't transcend that thinking, if we, stop, if we don't stop objectifying nature so that we can commodify it, if we don't get off the treadmills of political, ideological, and, and, and cultural hating and fighting each other, then we will literally dig our own uh, graves. And we will leave it to our grandchildren, you know, to, 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 to put up the final tombstone. Um... Now, I don't want to sound like a, uh, an apocalyptic thinker, right? I don't think that our, our self-destruction is inevitable. I don't think that our self-destruction is unavoidable. I don't think that our self-destruction is self-deserved. Yeah, we fucked up as individuals, as a species, and in every way you can imagine in between. But forgiveness transcends that fuckery. Forgiveness and healing repairs the damage we've done. And it empowers us to see more clearly so that we can evolve, change our behavior, and choose more wisely next time. So as we suffer through these dramatic events, as we witness the suffering of others during these dramatic events, let us remember and let us help each other by reminding one another. that we have tools to heal and reintegrate our, our traumatized spiritual selves, that we have tools to transcend. We have tools to heal. We have tools to reunite. We have tools to... 
um, evolve beyond the the petty and two-dimensional views and ideas and tools that got us here. We have other tools than the ones we've been using to abuse and destroy ourselves and each other. Now, the thing is, we're all addicts in my humble perspective. And I say that with love, not with judgment. We're addicted to our phenomenological baseline experience. We're addicted to breathing and eating food and and having bowel movements. We're addicted to thinking thoughts and believing our own thoughts and then judging the world around us by those thoughts. We're addicted to language. We're addicted to ideological constructs. We're addicted to creating our own mental cages that divide us and separate us and make make us feel like we must be the righteous ones because they are all so horrible. And as addicts, we're so caught up in our addiction that the only thing we can do is look out in outrage and judge everyone else and 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 chaotically demand that they be addicted to the same specific list of vices that we are when what we are called to do when we could be doing what we ought to be doing what we should be doing is healing ourselves of those addictions so that we can heal one another of those addictions so that we can return to a place where we are dealing with each other, engaging with one another, and working collaboratively together free of those addictions. Having liberated ourselves from those mental constructs that prevent us from seeing that most of politics is shenanigans and theater. And that while that may be true, there's also good and and just and fair uh, people trying to do the right thing in politics. Right? Just as that is true in organized religion, just as that is true in any socioeconomic organization or or experience or, or endeavor. Through that kind of work, healing, integrative, transcendent work, we will be able to finally um, achieve a sort of And I know this can easily start to sound, oh, you're just selling some sort of imaginary utopian hippie new age blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I I totally acknowledge that that's the slippery slope, right? That's the ego trap uh, in this particular theme or, or, or area of discourse. But for every ego trap, there's some sort of thing that I don't have a word for that's the inverse opposite of. For ev- and there's lots of ego traps, friends. As I've said before on the show, it's a pin on the corkboard. Ego knows the path better than we do. Because ego is us. It's not some separate entity. It is us. It is also part of the spiritual, transcendental, um, esoteric, phenomenological uh, structures and and phenomena in the universe that technically predate us as as corporeal beings um, but are directly responsible for our existence. And ego is not inherently evil, but it is because of the spiritual trauma that has bifurcated the white wolf and the black wolf, the yin and the yang, the divine nature from the from the debased nature. It is addicted to perpetuating that traumatic division. It 
it thinks it is defending itself and its right to perpetuate its own existence. But what's missing, what, what ego rejects, is that it is a component of whatever it's inverse opposite of, right? The yin and the yang are inseparable. The light and the dark are inseparable. They're not mutually uh, exclusive opposites, but rather mutually co-creative, polemic, interrelated... Um, oh, there's another term that just fell out of my brain. But you get where I'm going with this, right? Like, the light and the dark don't want to destroy each other. They want to reunite, to transcend the bifurcated state of operations that they are currently in. Good and bad are not in a war to annihilate one another, but they are in a, in a struggle to give up the, the hallucinations and addictions that keep them apart because they are addictive. And they were arguably a little necessary in order to get to the place where life became possible. But that's a whole nother episode of Deep Discussion. Dear friends, thank you for tuning in and forgive me for spiraling in such uh, seemingly chaotic ways. Uh, if you sort of lost the thread in my discussion there, uh, forgive me. Uh, but I, I, invite, I humbly invite you to give it time and to sort of skip across the surface of my podcast, skim across the content of my uh, podcast until you find yourself getting sucked in deeper and deeper. Because um, like the, the phenomena I'm discussing, my discourse is not a straight line narrative. I didn't create a podcast in order to tell you the things in category one, the things in category two, my conclusions in category three. I created the podcast to be raw, real, radical, and unscripted. And hopefully one day listened to live by a large and engaged audience so that we it becomes more of a, a dialogue. I'm trying to create a space so that we all can engage in public discourse with each other. To that end, I humbly invite you to visit solo.to forward slash Mr. Zeppo. That's where you'll find all of my social media contact points. And of course, the other content creation platforms that I'm experimenting with that are part and parcel of my overall idea of a sort of multi-dimensional collaboration of content creation. If you've got thoughts, if you've got questions, if you've got suggestions, recommendations, rebuttals, arguments, everything except hate speech and, and violent threats and pointlessly meaningless petty playground trolling, if you really want to engage in a discussion, reach out, drop me uh, your message. Um, now, when it comes to the podcast, the most the most cohesive way that I'll understand that you're addressing a specific set of comments or an idea that I explore in a particular episode, please, please, please do come on down to Sprecher.com forward slash show forward slash Zencast. You can find that direct link over on my my landing page, solo.to forward slash Mr. Zeppo. And simply by going there to click through to go to the other pages, you help facilitate, you know, the algorithms and all that so that other people can also sort of discover and land on that page and find the other content that I'm discussing. But if you want to specifically comment on this episode, for example, the most direct way for me to understand and connect your, th your comments to this episode is to go to this episode's home base at Sprecher.com. The next best place is the Facebook page. So if you're already on Facebook and you feel more comfortable doing it there, there is a Facebook page for the Almost Daily Zencast. You can find the direct link for that on solo.to forward slash Mr. Zeppo. And you can also just search in Facebook by looking up the Almost Daily Zencast. Um, and there you can find um, the Facebook page with the, the, the you know, the, the whatever you call it, the things for the instances of each episode, and you can directly comment there. Um, but yeah, thoughts, welcomes, uh, thoughts, 
questions, critiques, and real genuine discourse. Because I'm not here to preach. I'm not here to dictate my thoughts so that others can just blindly nod and agree and be like, yep, cool. I'm here to have and engage in and, and add my voice to the chaotic cacophony of public discourse. Um, and then find that audience, attract that audience uh, where we can kind of narrow down the discourse that we see out there in, in the wider world and have our own more focused discussion about it all. So thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for telling your friends about it. Thank you for following, subscribing, liking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I will see you uh, next time with another episode. Uh, DJ Z is looking at me like I'm crazy. I never played a second song for this episode. So here we go. Uh, a recently published track, Gravitas Grammatica by DJ Z and myself. Please enjoy. And then I'll bid you a fun farewell. Until next episode.
like this track and the other one I played today, uh, both of which were truncated in their length for this show, uh, you can hear them in their entirety over at soundcloud.com forward slash Mr. Zeppo. Just one of the many dimensions of the Zeppoverse, which you can explore by visiting solo.to forward slash Mr. Zeppo. Thank you again, friends. Um, I felt like I wanted to say one last thing. Uh, and that's... I. I've talked about it before, and I don't know why I feel compelled to say this now, but sometimes I get asked, why do you call your podcast the Almost Daily Zencast if you very rarely talk about Zen in a formal fashion? Um, because here's my answer. I'm not a member of any Zen school of ideology. I think that there's a difference between uh, the ideological constructs of any organized religion or spiritual practice and the phenomena of it, right? To me, Zen is a practice, not a set of ideological belief systems. This is my Zen practice. Before, during, and after each broadcast, I do and invoke what tools I know and, and find useful to me in a medita meditative and com contemplative way Although I underutilize my actorly vocal warm-up skills sometimes and therefore sound mushy-mouthed instead of the kind of, you know, sharp theatrical elocution for which I was known back in my day in, in the industry and in school. And that's me being a bad practitioner of the, the theater arts. Um, I invoke a Zen practice. And, and people are like, well, what does that mean? Uh... For example, before the show, every time, before I hit go live, I sit in a period of meditative contemplation and prayer. And I ask uh, for guidance from, from the sources that I feel connected to on what to speak about and on how to speak about it. And then whilst in the show, especially during the music, I invoke and, and, and continue that contemplative, meditative state and focus on just broadcasting from within my being to everyone who's listening, um, whatever peace, love, and energy I can muster to broadcast, to share with you. Uh, unconditional, spiritual... solidarity right to connect with you as a as an audience member uh remotely through spiritual means i don't I, I don't claim to be psychic but i do for lack of a better term believe in the the spiritual psychic abilities of the human species as natural organic and inherent to our phenomena. Uh, but that's a, whole, that's a whole episode's worth of discourse. I just wanted to pop back on and share that with you for anyone who hasn't and heard me explain it before. And I'll apologize for the moment of redundancy when you hear me explain it again. Thanks again. Namaste to you. I send you my love and my unconditional appreciation and my and my un my unconditional love and my unconditional appreciation and my and my unconditional energy and and gratitude for tuning in and listening until next time i pray that you find what you need in the world that you discover what you need in yourself to be the best human being you can be to yourself and to those around you. Both when it's easy and when it's hard. Or as I say on my video game stream channel, remember to be good humans to each other, both in the gaming lobby and out there in the real world. But that's a whole nother thing. Pin on the cardboard. Thanks again, my friends. Uh, may peace, love, and grooviness blossom in your heart.
And that is what I've got to say about that. As always, thank you kindly for listening. This has been the Almost Daily Zencast. With your humble host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppel. Until next time, may peace, love, and grooviness blossom in your heart.